All right, welcome everybody. So we're starting off today with a quick recap of where we have come. So let's go all the way back to session one, and this is the slide where your PowerPoint starts, the group that's in front of you. So what we talked about on the first day was what is integrated independent housing? What does this mean and why are we here? <laughs> and how is that housing different from the services you're going to bring into the housing? And, and how do you pair those two kind of ideas together? And then we wanted to learn some about the basic definitions of housing things. What is affordable housing? What is a housing voucher you know, versus what is a waiver? And all those kinds of things. How do they pair together? And then we started to talk about how you're going to apply for the vouchers. Because at that time, we had some Department of Justice vouchers still available for Fairfax County for people who were eligible who could jump right in to a sustainable, affordable housing resource. And for Fairfax County, those vouchers are sort of on a temporary closure, um, about to open back up again, but they're still open for Arlington and Alexandria and possibly Loudoun, and it seems like things are still rolling along otherwise. So for folks who are eligible for that DOJ voucher, that door is pretty much as open now as it was when we started this process. So thinking back again, if that's something you said, oh, maybe that's something I'll loop back to, this is your cue to loop back to it. <laughs> uh, and if this is not that time and you're thinking, you know, we would love to do this now, but we can't for a few more years. My kiddo's 16 or my kiddo's still going through things and they've still got to be living with us for a little bit longer, making sure you're getting on some listservs to do that. And so your work during this session, based upon all this great learning we were doing, was to go through that orange housing guide that the Arc of Northern Virginia has. It says transition point housing guide on the front and circle a handful of housing models that you thought were viable options based upon what you knew for your loved one. And that was the lens we were going to kind of use as we applied all of these other factors, roommates and budget and location and all these other pieces. As we went through the rest of this section, you were going to go back and pair it up with those first options you'd picked out and said, all right, well, if we want this affordable housing unit versus if we want to you know, it's a transferred placement uh, option versus if we want a cluster department, how do these other pieces work in with it or don't they? And how much does that matter to me? So I would say if you haven't, go back to that guide again. Look at those first handful of options that you circled and thought were most viable for your loved one. And are they still? You know, have you narrowed it down to one? That's great. If you narrowed it down to zero, go back and look over again. <laughs> you know, see if some things initially that you had ruled out thinking, you know, I, don't, I think this is going to require them being more independent than they realistically are. If now that you're thinking about services in a different way, you think, oh, maybe this is a good fit, or maybe they can be f physically farther apart from me in living than I thought they could initially, so long as we have other supports in place and things like that. You always want to keep in mind what that list of options are because when things like DOJ vouchers open or other things like that, that's the time to strike, right? You already want to know, yes, this is an option we already know is viable. We've already played out some of the scenarios that go along with exploring this option, so we want to be first in line asking for the supports that are available at this time. And we talked about at that point doing your self-assessment. We've gone back and forth and back and forth with that self-assessment about making sure you know what they have and need in terms of supports and in terms of housing. And so when we pulled that self-assessment out, we, we thought about, okay, how does this apply to the housing models that we're looking at? Do we know that we need a housing model that's going to need to be fully accessible? Do we know we need a housing model that's going to accommodate a live-in aid? Do we know we need a housing model that's going to be close to public transportation? Those kinds of things to get you going uh, and the resources that you had to bring to bear to put those things in place. And then lastly, looking at which housing subsidy programs you were going to explore. So you figured out your short list of housing options. You've taken stock of what you have to bring to the table to make some of those options work. And then you said, if I don't have enough to bring to the table today to make these options work, what housing subsidy programs are we going to explore to meet that financial gap, to make the housing options that are a good fit for my loved one a match for their affordability needs? So that's where we were with section one. So if all of this isn't ringing great bells, I would say go back and look at it again. <laughs> uh, you are only shortchanging yourselves by having spent all this really amazing time here and not coming up with the plan. It's very easy to say I'll go back to that later, but let's face it, like we don't, right? <laughs> we are adults and we are busy. So this is your cue. This is your time to go back to it. You want this, this kind of binder ready to go with everything you're going to want and need to look at housing. So the next session, we talked a lot about circles of support. 
So hopefully by that time we had our idea about housing models that were going to work and we did our support needs assessment, so we were our self assessment, and we were getting a sense of what we already had to bring to the table to make it work. And then we were going to build our circle of support to fill in whatever gaps were remaining. If we were going to look at us downsizing to a smaller unit and our kids staying in their childhood home, do we need a property manager on our circle of support? You know, do we need someone who's going to oversee finances? Do we, need, do we not have a waiver and we need folks on our circle of support who were willing to help with privately managing hiring staff or were willing to do drop-in supports or to do a social and rec activity with our loved one once a week or once a month or whatever that looks like for you and to start figuring out who those people were and to build them. So at that point, we all did a workshop where there was a kind of little smiley face in the, in the middle, and then there were four quadrants around it. We were trying to balance some of those quadrants with paid people in our loved ones' lives, because while paid people have a different kind of motivation in a lot of cases to work with our loved ones, there's a durability element there, right? <laughs> they are hired to work with you, and they're not just going to say, oh, things have gotten really busy here. We're not going to do this anymore. You wanted friends and family there, right? They know your loved one best. They have that history. They do have that drive to be involved. And you wanted your community support players, people from their social groups, from your social groups, from your houses of worship, from wherever else it was in your broader community, and pulling on the strengths of all of those people together to craft kind of your super team behind you, this group of folks who could be this, the backup network for your loved one with a disability, and remembering this is going to flex over time, but if you've got nothing now, we're better with a semicircle than, <laughs> than nothing, if you will, right? So we want to start building this, and we want to start talking to people and meeting people in terms of housing and support and figuring out, are you someone who is a resource for my circle, who I'm going to say go to this person if they have questions, or are you someone who's potentially going to be on the circle? Are you committed enough to my loved one to meet a handful of times a year to go through and brainstorm some options for them to be more actively involved? So we want to make sure that we're not losing those contacts as we go along the way, that we're continuing to harness and kind of mentally file those folks in terms of how can we bring you in and continue to leverage you. You're going to talk to a lot of folks in this journey, and it's very easy to forget them unless you've got a way to keep track with them and other people who know how to keep track with them. So we were hoping at this point folks would start drafting their, their own circle, coming up with your short list of folks you wanted to be on it, and start making that ask to have people. And as we talked about, a lot of that ask, a brilliant way to do it is to say, this is what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to take over. I don't want you to feel responsible for all of this, but you've got some amazing strengths and talents that I see. Are you willing to share a little bit of those a little bit at a time to help my loved one who needs some support? So from there, we had our ideas about housing models that would work and kind of things we would need. We were assembling our team to help us get through this, and then we took a really intensive look at the, the uh, assessment of your loved one's physical needs and the support services we were going to need to be bringing in. So if it's more than you already had in terms of a waiver or other support staff, and it's more than a circle is realistically going to do, what else are we going to need? Do you have a really good plan for the support services that they're going to need and a funding stream to put those supports in place? So for a lot of folks, that's going to be a Medicaid waiver. For plenty of folks at this table, it's not going to be. So this is your time to start thinking about if we are not eligible for a waiver, period, or we are on a very long waiting list for a waiver now, what do we do in the meantime? Do we leverage a live-in aid and get support services that way in exchange for free rent? Do we use our circle to do some drop-in services? Do we use private money for some private hiring of attendance in the meantime? How do you figure out what these holes are and start to plug them in terms of support services? And just like with your circle, someone's support needs are probably going to change over time, and not necessarily just in this direction, but in these up, up and down hands for people on the phone, uh, all over the place directions, because what we see often is that folks, even who have very significant needs, when they start moving towards a more independent housing opportunity, so long as they've got good supports in place, they rise to the occasion a little bit. In the same way your parents sent you off to college when you were 18 and thought you were going to crash and burn, you were 18, you have no idea what you're doing, you crashed and burned a little, and you rose to the occasion a lot. So that's, that's what we see a lot with people with disabilities, too. When you feel more independent, you feel like you have more power over your life, people tend to participate more actively. And a lot of times, the support team is very surprised 
and what they see there. So making sure that you've got supports that can flex with this person over time. If they have a medical need that changes and they need increased supports, or if we start to see some of those more independent skills growing, and we want to change the way that they get things. We want less personal care and we want more skill development. We're seeing growth there. Uh, so here we wanted a plan of action for finding and hiring your caregivers. We went over that caregiver guide that the ARC put out um, in, a, in a fair amount of depth that talks through ways to privately hire care staff, either through a waiver or with private dollars, how you find them, how you craft the job. Um, I think we admitted to ourselves during this session that unless you are a gajillionaire who can pay people endless sums of money to do this job, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough if you do it with consumer-directed services and you do the hiring, and it's going to be tough if you're relying on an agency to do it because you're giving up some control and power there. That certainly does not mean it's not worth doing. As someone who does the child care battle on a very, very frequent basis, <laughs> trying to arrange and rearrange things, we do it because we're parents and we love our kids and we want them to have the right supports. And no one, I don't think, goes into parenthood thinking, like, one day I'll turn this all over. I'm still humiliated at times to go to my mom and ask for help and support. And in many ways, I should be a typically developing, capable adult, right? But that's kind of part of parenthood, that we're always going to be involved to some degree. And when you're thinking, I won't be able to do this forever, that's when we go back to, well, what circle of support did you build around this person? And who are your players on your circle who are going to help with this process when you are no longer able to do it? And are we training them as we go? Are they working with you now on hiring staff? Do they have eyes and ears out at their college or at their kids' college? Do they have resources for posting their ads? Do they have kids who want to live in a job? You know, these kinds of things and using that network is a great way to find care staff beyond just kind of the, the cold search of putting ads out there. Uh, and then Jeannie shared a fantastic document on your own supports plan. So you can, if you have a, an active waiver, you'll have a plan for supports. If you don't think that's comprehensive or you want to add to it, or if you don't have a waiver now or won't have a waiver, it's a great tool for putting together what hours of support you know, do we see are needed and, and what are people doing during these hours? Are you monitoring the person? Are you actively teaching them a skill? Are you doing something for them? Are you providing social supports? Those kinds of things and getting a sense of all of that so that, again, as, you, as opportunities arise, as waivers come up, as support people fall in your lap, as you meet new people who may be good options, you have something to tell them <laughs> and a way to move forward rather than just saying, right, I knew that I talked about this once. <laughs> Let's sit down and try and figure out what we need. All right. So for our last session, we talked about budget, location, and amenities. Now that we had our short list of housing options, we had our team on board to help us with things, we knew what we were going to need in terms of services and supports. Well, where on earth are we going to do all this and how are we going to pay for it? So we talked about our budget and making things work with SSI alone is tough. So if that is your reality, you pretty much know we're going to need a housing subsidy of some sort. So going back to that first session, what housing options allow that housing subsidy? How can I use it? How can I get on a waiting list for them? Uh, if we have some other income to leverage, how is that going to affect other benefits and make this housing more or less affordable in proportion to that extra income that's coming in? And no matter what, how can we increase the money that we have coming in and decrease the money that we have going out? as a way to help make this affordable and more sustainable over time. That's what we want to make sure that we have a really good eye on. And the budgets are going to be tight, and we kind of swallowed that pill that for most of our kids, even though we are probably not living in poverty, they realistically are probably living at or near or below the poverty line. Uh, and that things for them are going to look different. Like we gave up our idea of granite countertops, right? Like in the things that maybe matter more to us than it does to them. And we started thinking about, what are ways that we make things affordable and safe for them without trying to overhaul all of Fairfax County and put Fairfax County in a safety bubble, right? <laughs> How do we find a safe unit for them that's safe for them because the unit itself is physically safe, but because we've got support people coming in who help make it safe and keep eyes and ears on them? And we talked about how you would kind of rank your needs and wants in terms of things. And then there are tons of great resources and websites we gave out to start looking for rooms to rent. And it's a great exercise to run through and take that needs and wants list and start looking at what that buys you. When I was looking at first moving to this area, I really wanted a washer and dryer inside my unit, and I was astounded at what a bright line of affordability that was. 
I, it had never even occurred to me as a kid who grew up with a washer and dryer in her house that that was a make or break difference for some units, in part because of the physical space it took up, but the hookups it took up. You know, I was looking at places that I could afford because they were much, much older, <laughs> and they didn't have built-in space for these kinds of things, and they may not have had the electrical wiring that's capable of running those big old plugs. So running through, is there a way around that? Can we do laundry at home? If that's, a, if that's something that's really important to us, avoiding that time at the washer and dryer machine uh, in a communal space. So coming up with your really specific budget, your ranked needs, and then potential areas for housing. So looking at locations, driving by neighborhoods, looking at places on that affordable housing list that we sent out, a huge list of apartments that often accept the voucher or have affordable set-aside units. Look at over there. At different times of day, is this a place we could live? Oh, this maybe is more walkable than I thought. This maybe does have a different community feel than I thought. Maybe this is closer to work than I thought. Maybe it's not near a metro, but it's near a bus line, and we can do travel training, and we can make those kinds of things work. So just making your mind flex a little bit about what your dream placement is. Uh, and then we went back to knowing what you need to apply for the voucher because, again, the budget is such a good reminder that for a lot of people we're going to have some kind of housing subsidy, be it a voucher or other support mechanism, to make this housing affordable. So this is everything that we should have known, and when you think about it, that's a ton, right? Even if you haven't done all of this work to have sifted through all of this information in your mind and started running through it, you all deserve a ton of credit. <laughs> this is a lot <laughs> to have bitten off. It should feel like it's a lot of information. It's going fast because a whole person's life is what we're talking about here, right? Your housing and your supports and how we connect you with everything else in it. This is a lot, but you are really going somewhere with this very, very fast. It should be exciting, far more than it is overwhelming. And so from here today, we're going to talk about finding a roommate. So now that we know all these pieces in this budget, and maybe we thought a great way to manage our budget is to cut it in half and have somebody else live with us. Uh, or we're talking about, and then our next session, we're going to talk about getting ready to actually make the move. If we've done all these pieces, we've got our supports in place, we know what we need, we've got our voucher in place, we know where we're going to use it, how do we actually Find the place, the specific place where we're going to live. How do we work with a realtor or housing search locator to put all those pieces in place? What is our moving budget? What does it look like to get all the pieces done that we're going to require for a move? And getting all those things, like the real nitty-gritty details in place, because yeah. so far we've talked about all these kind of big-picture ideas. And how, where does the rubber meet the road there? And so our next to the last session is going to be a panel of parents who have done this in varying forms or fashions, who have had kids move out with vouchers, who have turned their own home over to a nonprofit and had their kids move in there, who have had kids move in with a roommate, who have done this from the other side, and most of them pretty recently, and can speak to, yep, overwhelming, yep, it's a lot, but we are at a crazy different place than we ever thought we would be. And I, you have my word, I did not cherry pick people who had really amazing experiences. I talked to anybody I know who had done this in the last year or two and said, you want to come talk? Um, and they, everyone said, yes, absolutely, I would love to share this, and I wish that I had known these things as a parent. So definitely be wrapping your mind around making a list of questions in the next few weeks that you want to ask from a parent perspective, somebody who's done this. And then our final session will, yes? Yeah. What date is that? July 20th. And then our very last session on August 3rd is going to be wrapping it all up. So we'll craft that actually closer to the end once we have a sense from you all about what you feel like is hanging out there. What are the things that we still don't know or still don't know how to put together? And we'll work together as a group to put those final touches on your housing and support futures plan so that you feel like we're ready to go in some form or fashion. <laughs> So that's where we're going to go. <laughs> You've come a long way. And we'll kick off today in talking about this living with roommates and roommate problem solving, which was a really fun session to write because this is a universal issue, right? Like <laughs> disability or no, a lot of the things that we've talked about are so disability dependent, but dealing with roommates really is something we all do. Though so our folks are often going to have a kind of different twist on how we manage that. So. Again, phone's on mute, you're being recorded, so your charming voices will be there for posterity. Remember to keep things discreet if you would like. Uh, again, I'm Lucy with The Arc. Dennis and Jeannie are still here with us. No new faces here, no new voices for those on the phone. And 
today's I'll outline. turn things over to Des. So now we're officially starting today's session. That was that recap. And Lucy, I think you have a future in writing cliff notes. You <laughs> summarize that so well. Gosh, that was just perfect. So we're going to talk about types of roommates today. We're going to get into, you know, do, are you looking for a companion? Are you looking for a best friend? Are you looking for something that economically spits, splits the expenses? Whatever it is, we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about why I have a roommate. It, it's an obvious economic uh, factor, but it might be for your person companionship. It might be a safety element. It could be many things. So come at it open-ended in terms of why we would have a roommate. Finding roommates, we're going to give you some tips and clues, not only what to do, but things to avoid and things to be cautious about. Uh, reviewing, reviewing your roommate questionnaires, which you've probably completed. For those of you who may not have come to all the sessions, hopefully you have this material, and just follow along. We're not going to put you on the spot and have you read it. Anticipating and preparing for potential issues. The three of us are the biggest worry warts you'd ever want to meet, so we've thought about everything. But there might be some more that you'll help us to worry about. Uh, chore charts. I think these come from our three personal experiences with our college and our college roommates and whatever. Okay. Barbara, you might have some thoughts on this on the chore list. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Roommate agreements, you know, we've said this over and over, don't assume anything. Talk it through. Write it down. Let's get the stuff ironed out. We who have co strong cognitive abilities have trouble with this. If our loved ones don't have strong cognitive abilities, assumption is not something you want to do. It is just too vague. <laughs> oh, go on. And um, favorite roommate. All right, I'm not going to profile you by age, but are you thinking Mork and Mindy? Are you thinking Golden Girls? Are you thinking Three's Company? Are you thinking Friends? Or are you thinking something else? No, seriously, they're all, when you think about how our society has portrayed them through the years, it sort of picks up some of the cultural things, like Three's Company was revolutionary. There was mixed gender. My gosh, nowadays it's like, Nothing. That is absolutely <laughs> a non-issue. My daughter met two guys on Craigslist in New York. They were the most wonderful roommates mm -hmm. she could find. Of course, my sister all went and checked them out beforehand, mm -hmm. just uh, visually checked them out. Mm -hmm. But seriously, it, it, you know, be open. Be open. Worked out fine. Golden Girls, I'm not having a comment on that. <laughs> no comment at all. Um, next, we're going to go on, and Jeannie's going to really talk about... Uh, this piece here, and probably with less uh, sarcasm than I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a this is a really great cartoon if you have a chance to read it. Uh, uh, but basically, there are, there are a number of different types of roommates that you might look at. Um, you might look at uh, a, a roommate who's a friend, who's just living with you because they're friends, and, and lots of friendships evolve over time, whether it's through school, whether it's through work, whether it's through um, recreation. And folks just get together, and they, that's how they decide they're going to uh, live together. It may be just sort of a, uh, a cohabitant who shares space but keeps their life mostly separate. Those are the Craigslist folks yeah, right, right. <laughs> that, uh, that Dennis was mentioning. Um, it might be a family member who somebody other than mom or dad. So you might get a sibling. In fact, I just had a, a, an individual call me the other day, or a family member call me the other day saying, it never occurred to me, but maybe my my son and my daughter might actually want to move in together. I said, yeah, maybe they might. You might ask them. Um, it might be a homeowner who rents you a room. And what we're, we're finding this more and more often is with older adults who have become widowed or widowered, if that's a word, <laughs> um, who are now single and actually are looking for some companionship. And they have space in their house, um, and now they're, of course, on a fixed income, and they need to be able to rent that space to be able to make some money and, uh, and pay their mortgage, potentially. And, so and, and Jeannie, awesome. I might add, they have every household supply you yeah. ever need. Every, yeah. yeah, fully furnished. <laughs> <laughs> so this has become actually more and more of a, of a, of a trend as, as, uh, as the baby boomers are aging. Um, Another type of roommate is just someone who receives free room uh, and or board in exchange for providing support. 
And there are a couple of ways that this can occur, and you'll see them here. So one is the shared living service under the new waivers, the new Medicaid waivers that we talked about. So that's a service where um, the, if you have uh, the new uh, waiver, and I believe this is offered specifically in the um, building independence waiver and the family and individual sports waiver. It's not in the community living waiver. But um, so, so the distinction on those, that would be the community living is the current ID. Right. So the current ID would not have that. Exactly. But uh, the current DD and day support waivers will be transformed into those building independence and family and independent support waivers, and they will offer this shared living service. And the shared living service is basically that service that we talked about a couple sessions ago where an individual may rent a two-bedroom apartment and pay for the utilities of that two-bedroom apartment, and they might pay for, uh, you know, uh, cable and food. And they might have another individual live with them as a companion who's pretty much there solely to uh, provide sort of fellowship and emotional support, and not a whole lot of uh, things that might be considered activities of daily living or skill building mm -hmm. kinds of training. So it's much more sort of eyes on there, there to provide some social and recreation companionship types of things. Um, in exchange for receiving free room and board. Um, and what the shared living service under the waiver will do, since the waiver can't pay for housing for the individual, meaning the, the, the Medicaid recipient, it will pay for the portion of the rent, utilities, cable, and food that are attributable to the companion in that arrangement. So the individual will pay for all of that stuff up front and then get reimbursed for the proportionate share that's attributable to the companion. What well, Jeannie's not saying is this is revolutionary for the yeah. state to be this thinking outside the box. <laughs> really, really different. Yeah. Now, this of course assumes that the individual has that funding up front to be able to pay for a two-bedroom apartment, utilities, mm -hmm. and, and food, and all of those things. So there's there are some assumptions made there that may or may not be accurate, <laughs> but that's the way, that's the principle behind this, behind this. So this may not work for somebody very well if they're on SSI, but it might work for somebody who's on SSDI, for example. So that's one way of, of uh, re doing this model where someone receives free room and board in exchange for providing support. Another way would be what we call that live-in aid accommodation under the oh. first. I'm sorry, Katie. The, the individual. individual with disability yes. is paying for it, and they'll be reimbursed, yes. or the other person has to pay, and they'll be the reimbursed. The individual with a disability is okay. paying, and they will be reimbursed. They're the waiver recipient. Mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly. And this is not the community living wage. No. No. Correct. But ostensibly, an individual can transfer from one waiver to another. Right now, the state only has 40 slots available for those transfers to accommodate 10,000 people. So it was not well thought out. But ostensibly, you can appeal that and say, no, I belong in this waiver, I don't belong in that waiver. And is that the main, is that the only difference? I know we don't want to get into waiver discussion, sure. but is that the only difference between the two? Between the two, the two the community, community living waivers? Oh, no, there are many other differences. The, yeah. the main thing to think about is community living is the only one that has 24 7 Congress. Right. right. So while these, while what Jeannie describes isn't in community living, what's not in the other two is the quote unquote of a group home. Right. I haven't seen the full list. Right. That'll there are other services that are not in community living that we are. We can send out our waiver case. services chart yeah. that we did. I think the last time again too, which walks you through a description of what's in each. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the other way to uh, do this sort of uh, roommate who receives free room and board in exchange for providing support is that live-in aid accommodation under the voucher. So now remember, shared living under the waiver, that's leveraging your waiver services to get a, uh, a roommate that's providing some minimal, minimal support. Live-in aid accommodation under the voucher is leveraging your housing subsidy to get a roommate that might be providing minimal or more intensive mm -hmm. supports under the waiver. Um, Such an important distinction for some folks who are thinking we're on a waiver waiting list or waiver ineligible or a voucher waiting list. You know, I mean, there are different ways to come at the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So in this one, where you have the live-in aid accommodation under the voucher, we just covered this in the webinar uh, last week. Um, you're basically using your voucher, which is what's paying the housing subsidy, the rent assistance, and you're going to the voucher program and you're saying, I need a reasonable accommodation, which is an exception to the program rules, um, to be able to get a, uh, a live-in aid which is somebody who's basically essential to the individual's care and support that enables them to be able to live in housing with a rent subsidy. And the reasonable accommodation, the changes in the rules that that involves are basically several. One of them is it's changing the unit type that the person would normally be approved for. They would normally be approved for a one bedroom because they're one person, right? Now they're gonna be approved for a two bedroom because it's the individual with a disability and the aid. So that's one change to the rule. Another change to the rule is normally when you are looking at a household, you're looking at the income of everybody in that household when you're determining the eligibility for the program and when you're determining the percentage of the income of that household that goes to be paid toward the rent. Well, when you have a living aid, you don't look at that AIDS income. That doesn't get factored in when you're looking at both the eligibility for the program and the percentage of total household income that gets paid toward rent. You're only looking at the individual's income. So what that means is essentially the AIDS, the, the only income that's being factored in is the individual's. So the AIDS essentially getting free room and board in exchange for providing those essential supports to be for that individual with a disability to live in that unit. If that aid ever does not provide those supports, that aid has to leave. <laughs> so you need to understand the flip side of this arrangement. So if the individual says you're fired, then the aid has no rights to tenancy and the aid needs to leave. Otherwise, the individual, and the individual is going to have to find another aid because otherwise the individual is now overhoused. Okay? Mm -hmm. So just you need to understand sort of the how the dominoes fall in these kinds of situations, but, those, but that's another way that an individual can actually get leverage, live in, uh, leverage uh, basically free room and board in exchange for getting services. So the third way would be basically getting a live-in caregiver in privately paid housing. This is just a very simple situation of if you are a family that after you've done all the budgeting and looking at your uh, housing and support needs assessment, determine what resources you can bring to the table to assist in your loved one with housing. If you've determined that perhaps you can help that individual swing a two-bedroom apartment over the course of time, then you're just entering into a private arrangement with a live-in caregiver saying, we will uh, assist, we, we will cover the room and board, basically the rent, utilities, whatever you want to cover, really. Rent, utilities, if you want to cover food, you cover food. If you don't want to cover food, you don't cover food. <laughs> in exchange for you providing certain supportive services to the individual in this two-bedroom unit. But it's a private arrangement. You're not using a voucher. You're not using a waiver. It's just you assisting the individual to cover the rent and utilities for a two-bedroom apartment in exchange for that individual providing, living with the individual and providing uh, minimal or moderate, whatever it is, support. Jeannie, if I could comment on that, even though the other examples Jeannie mentioned had regulations and rules, you should put some regulations and rules mm -hmm. in that one too, in that last one. Even though it's a private arrangement, you should yeah. have this written. This and should there, not be discussing right. in a Starbucks. And there are DOL, <laughs> Department of Labor, yeah. labor regulations that you would still have to follow. Now, when you're doing it, when it's just simply a uh, payment of, uh, it, when there are no wages, cash just wages exchange, it's just room and board, there are fewer, and, and the person is a live-in caregiver and they're only providing companion services versus doing actual activities of daily living and skill building and stuff like that, it's very minimal regulation. So but there, no there are taxes. no regulations. But, there, but, there are no taxes unless the person starts providing over 20% of their time toward skill building, assistance with, you know, uh, 
different kinds of activities of daily living, lifting, transferring, you know, uh, dressing, grooming. And all those kind of nitty-gritty kind of gritty details are really well flushed out on that Within Aid mm -hmm. webinar that was like a standalone webinar, not in-person session we did last week right. to cover that separately, so that'll go out to folks. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but I'm, I'm suggesting you have some caution in the use of private arrangement. Yeah. For example, you do not necessarily want this person running a business out of the house. Yeah. You do not necessarily want this person to be having major parties with hundreds of people. You know, right. those kinds of things, you want to set the parameters. Right. Don't assume anything. Uh, right. that mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why, that's why you create an agreement. So, but these are the different types of roommates. And, and so some of them are very informal. Some of them start to, you know, get a little bit more formal as you go along. So let's talk about why you would consider a roommate. Well, you know, there are, there are definitely, you know, pros and cons. Um, if you're living with a roommate, some of the good parts about living with a roommate, obviously, are, like Dennis said before, you're sharing expenses. So that cuts down on your budget in half, in half in a lot of different budget categories that we talked about previously. Um, you, uh, if, if you're choosing not to pay for that person's expenses in exchange for something. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, you get a built-in social network. That that person's there. You're gonna you're gonna have opportunities to be able to socialize. If that person wants to, you may be able to do activities together outside the apartment, things like that. Um, this is somebody who's gonna be able to to bring different skills into your home. So sometimes you guys, the roommates may be able to sort of trade off uh, responsibilities. Um, you may get somebody who's really good at yard work or really good at managing money, and you might be the person who's really good at washing the dishes or taking the trash out or doing other things. And so you kind of come up with agreements where you actually sort of supplement each other's skills and can, can play off of each other pretty well. Um, again, we talked about the fact that it might be an opportunity for live and staff. And it's also an opportunity to, to kind of build in some safety, uh, uh, extra safety assistance there. Because if you've got another person who's got eyes on, um, it's really good that, that you, you can have another a way to be able to contact somebody if there's an emergency. Um, you've got someone whose who, uh, uh, eyes are on the person when if there's, if there's a health concern and somebody's health might be deteriorating, that person can be contacting you, letting you know, hey, I've noticed that something's going on lately and things just don't seem to be the way that they usually are. This person seems to be kind of moping around. They haven't come out of their room for a couple of days. You know, whatever it might be. Yeah. It, that's really helpful to have a roommate that can, that can do those kinds of things. However, for some people, living without a roommate might not be such a bad idea. <laughs> so, I see smiles. I, uh, <laughs> are smiles. You, you really need to know the individual and what works for the individual, right? Mm -hmm. So for some people, privacy is a real issue, and, and some people need their own space, and they need somebody who's not talking in their ear. Um, so you have, to, you have to choose well on your roommates. Um, so, so living without a roommate clearly is going to give an individual a lot more privacy. Um, Living without a roommate also gives you more options for creating your own schedule, being up late, making noise. You don't have to worry about working around the shower issue or working around the bathroom issue. Um, you can also keep the home the way you like it. You can have every room in the house as messy as you want to have it. And you don't have to worry about other people coming around and you going, ew, what's this? Oh my God, I can't believe it. Nobody ever did this around here. So, this is my house. You can I come to this the house right? <laughs> So, uh, so, so, you don't have to worry about those kinds of those kinds of confrontations occurring because of because of lifestyle habits. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Is that what those are called? Lifestyle <laughs> habits. Yeah. <laughs> so, you can also have guests when you choose without disturbing anybody. This can be a real issue with roommates because some roommates like to have lots of people over, or like to have people over at different times of the day, and if your individual just can't tolerate that in and out and that different noise level and things like that, then that, that may not be a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, you know, living without a roommate also limits environmental stimuli. It limits the fact that there's going to be changes because you're going to have unpredictable variables like noise levels, hmm. like new people coming in and out that that person doesn't necessarily know, like new uh, 
things that you have to get used to just in terms of behaviors that, that another person has that the person just might not be familiar with. So again, you have to be aware of the individual and understand whether the individual, the individual with a disability who is looking for housing can, can uh, has a flexible enough demeanor and, and ability to take, uh, take account of some of these things to know whether this is going to be a workable arrangement or not. All right. Let's all see, right. Let's talk about pros and let's, cons and how we think about these. Let's walk through, and you all have to talk. <laughs> so, pros and cons of roommates. What's the great thing about having a friend as a roommate? Social. Social. Super, right? You already know the person. They're already vetted to some degree. That's a really nice piece. What's a not-so-fun thing about having a friend as a roommate? Social. <laughs> 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 Very nice. <laughs> Um, one thing folks are often cautioned about is, is your friendship going to be ruined if your roommateship is ruined? It's possible. Yeah. I tend to like friends who are not particularly like me, and I very much enjoy spending time with them. I don't want to live that way every single second of my day, though. <laughs> so I don't want to live with them. <laughs> what about just a cohabitant, our older person who's renting a room out? Uh, someone who maybe is not going to have a whole lot of interaction with us, either in terms of friendship or support, but we're just physically sharing a space together. What's the great thing about this? They could be a role model if mm -hmm. it's an older person. Role model is great. Built in uh, eyes and ears, cost yeah. management. Uh, think, I mean, there's certainly safety aspects and support aspects and socialization aspects that go along here, even in very minor degrees. There is going to be someone who knows if a fire alarm who goes off. There is going to be someone who knows if in the middle of the night you're screaming and support staff not going to come help you. Those kinds of things happen. It's, it's a very low level of support, but it is extra eyes and ears, and you, you really can't even pay out of pocket to have that kind of support. So you would never pay someone out of pocket unless your loved one needed active overnight support to just be there listening next to them all night long. Uh, but this kind of gives you that, which is a nice, thing, uh, and it gives some natural backup to things. You can assume that some kind of friendship or congeniality will develop here. You've got that extra skill set, like Jeannie talked about, that's on hands here. So you may have a cohabitant who's great at gardening or great at the dishes, and you're great at the opposite, or whatever that looks like. So you're leveraging a lot of skills with this person and getting some backup and kind of safety supports, even if you're not actively having anything to do with them in a lot of ways. What's the thing that's not so fun about that? You might not have a lot of things in common. Too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. be hard to live tough. Mm -hmm. Can be tough. Uh, they can have just as many issues as you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I was going to offer that too. They might be very insensitive. They might be very intolerant. They might be very judgmental. You know, they're going to be in your or loved one's Or they might space. need support too. Right. Mm -hmm. And you just didn't know it. Yeah. They're very needy, and that's why they were seeking this arrangement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great thing about having a family member. They already know the individual. Sure, probably better than anybody else you've never hired, even for years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's the not so great thing about having a family member there? They're family. <laughs> <laughs> you will fight and love like family fights and love. Uh, and if we're talking about similar age siblings, there may come a point at which that sibling thinks. Get out of my life. You're holding me back. I want to go on a date. Even if that's very much in pairing with their arrangement, you have a different relationship, and you think you can say things differently to your sibling <laughs> than to your living aid. <laughs> and you can, but it's something that you would really just want to kind of think through in advance. All right, so we talked a little bit about our, our homeowner who rents a room, and how about a person who's receiving free room and board in exchange for providing support? There, that person might not be clear on what they're doing there. That's mm -hmm. true, which gets back to why you need a really good support plan and a really clear contract with them. You're going to need a lot of planning and vetting in advance. One of the great things about this that we talked about when Chris Davis joined our call and talked about her situation, she didn't have a waiver or any private money to pay for support staff. So she leveraged an extra bedroom into a way to make her son who had support needs live independently. She got a voucher that could fund a two-bedroom unit, and she leveraged that second bedroom for live-in staff who could provide support services. So it was a really clever way of working around 
some kind of the supports needs financial balance and support services balance. And maybe over time that will change for her. Maybe eventually her son will get a waiver and she'll decide she wants to structure things differently. But for most people, once you kind of settle into a routine, you learn it, right? Like all things in life, like anything new that you take on, you learn a little bit about it, you take all of that fear element at it, you get better at it, you get more tuned to when things are or aren't going to work, and you roll with the punches, just like everything else. So much of what we're talking about is really scary and overwhelming, and you can think of a million cons for any scenario. We would all just be sitting at home on our mm -hmm. couches rocking ourselves, right? Like if we live this way. Like sometimes I'm driving along in my car and I think, this is like the most dangerous thing I do every day. Like I'm really <laughs> 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 in your entire life, you're a positive person and you look for the pros and you highlight the pros with a lot of good planning and backup, That's what it takes. you'll yeah. always be fine. Because and even if it falls through, you'll say, I know what to do in this situation. Yeah. I've already outlined our yeah. plan for if things fall apart and mm -hmm. I have a, an avenue for a backup. And even mm -hmm. if that backup's not going to be here immediately, I've got a circle of support that I can pull from. Right. I've mm -hmm. got a backup care attendant who okay. can come even if it's for just a week. You know, you can start leveraging those things. So this is all about planning really, really tamps down that fear element and gets us from the con side to the pro side. So for so many folks, I think a roommate is going to be a reality at some point, especially when we talk about our folks on the autism spectrum who really maybe sometimes don't need a lot of supports but are inclined to t kind of turn in on themselves uh, and not leave the house and not do other things unless someone else is around, even if we're just talking about a cohabitant. It forces a little bit of socialization, passing somebody in the kitchen, you know, <laughs> you know a, little bit, a little bit of extra eyes and ears on the person who can alert somebody else if things seem to be going wrong, and a little bit of built-in socialization that doesn't involve your loved one having to have really good support people who are motivated, who get them excited about leaving the house and get them to go out to do all these wonderful things you want them to do. You've got a whole lot of that built in. And just like we talked about with social skills in general, the way most of us learn social skills is by being around people, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so this is a huge avenue for developing those skills. It may look different and it may be at a slower pace for our folks, but that's how we all learn social things. So we, really important things. Lucy, may I yeah. comment a little bit on Please. the homeowner who rents room? I have uh, friends who have a daughter with very serious uh, behavioral health and uh, mental illness and she's in her early 20s, and they found this was the best thing for her. She is renting a room in a house near here, and mm -hmm. for, for a number of reasons. One is there's sort of one financial detail. They're just dealing with the homeowner, and the homeowner is taking care of all the stuff with leases and utilities and all that. It's just one payment. There's a lot of portability. This young woman, unfortunately, has had numerous hospitalizations because of her situation, and so that's that works out okay. She's not like sort of abandoning her house. Mm -hmm. She's just leaving a room. It's very portable for her. They didn't have to buy a lot of stuff. They basically just had a, whatever she had in her house, her nightstand and her bed, Wait, yeah. and she's moving into a house. And from the parents' perspective, our friends' perspective, there's a lot of security. They mm -hmm. can call this person who's just this loving older homeowner who needed a little bit of extra money and it was an empty nester thing and they, they like the companionship. So I don't discard that. There, there are some jewels. They just randomly found it. You know, there are some jewels out there. It just was a click. So I just want to say don't disregard that. There are some people for very genuine reasons the homeowner wants this. I think the thing that, that worries me the most is, is the lease. Yeah. Because, you know, I'm looking now at, you know, this list is not going to open up. I mean, we're going to jump on this like 10,000 other people in Fairfax County, and we might not get on it. So I, I think within a year, my son, we have talked about it, and he wants to be out on his own in, in some place. And we've been looking at, at all of these options. and. Uh, you know, my concern at this point, of course, is since you don't have, you know, these vouchers or whatever, and you get a situation where you've got a lease and you've got someone, if he has a roommate that's not working out, you know, it kind of puts me in a position that's that I have to make sure I can either continue to afford right. the leasing issue or, so that, that's, 
Yeah, so there's a vulnerability with when that. When I had my yeah. own roommates, yeah. it became a problem. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, because it is legal, and you're mm-hmm. fine, and you're being held legally responsible to the, the apartment mm-hmm. complex or whatever. Well, it's a risk. You have to measure your own risk, just like in financial investments. You have to measure where you are. Yeah, you know. and, and I think what we're planning on doing is really stockpiling money mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. for just that, for... As Susie Orman says, your emergency. Right, your unexpected mm-hmm. expenses. You know, and, and so if we're looking at it that way, yeah. then, you know, we have to jump into it. You have to take the risk as you Right, can. right, yeah. right. But he is actually, he's, he's met somebody through the community services board. Oh. And we've met their family. And uh, this weekend, you know, I'm doing something with his mother and father, but my son, he has a, his, this guy Josh has a kid. Ma- Man cave. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they're all set. Video games and so, TV. Well, this is it. Yeah. So they're doing that for that, you know, to get to know each other. And we know that we're going to be, you know, six months long period of time to yeah. get to know each other and make sure things work out for both of them. But he's challenged by and excited. Mm-hmm. That's good. That's great. That's so good. that was just happened to be something from our case manager. Somebody else touched oh, base with them. Uh-huh. But that brings up a good point. Have these conversations. Make sure the support coordinator knows that you're at that point because they wouldn't. They're not going to bring that up otherwise. No. Okay. Yeah. I've never been here for mine. Ah. Well, then you need to get in their face. <laughs> <laughs> or get a new one. All right. How on earth are we going to find this person? So, this is not rocket science different from what talked about when we were talking about looking for care attendants, right? Like, use your social network, leverage, keep your eyes and ears open. Do not be afraid to talk about this because you never know if the person to whom you're speaking is going to say, the weirdest thing happened. I had a conversation just yes, like this with right. somebody the other day. Right. You will be shocked if you sat down here and couldn't leave this room until you made a list of every single person you know and talked to over the course of a month. We would be here for hours. Yeah. It's so many more people than you think about. People, when you call on the phone to place an order, the bill person at your doctor's office, the receptionist here, that, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's tons and tons of people. And I don't mean to say, like, you've got to yap it up with every single one of them. But think about, you have a much, much broader network than you realize. And kind of keeping your eyes and ears open with people with whom you're comfortable talking and let them know that you're thinking about things or planning things, they remember it. They will route someone back to you later. I do this all the time with folks. Sometimes people call me and ask me questions for things that, like, just resources that I couldn't imagine I'm ever going to come across. And sometimes, like, six weeks later, out of the blue sky, falls this bizarro doctor referral that they were asking for. And I'm like, I dig back through the email and mm-hmm. I'm like, the weirdest thing just happened. You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes you just yeah. kind of luck into yeah. these people. And it happens more often than not. Think about this in the same way you think about finding a first job, right? That same kind of thing. It's networking. It's who you know. It's the fluke person who happened to have a cousin who worked at the place. And mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's that kind of just talking to each other and getting to know people. And certainly if you're talking about your loved one's work or sports or recreation activity, that's a gold for because you're automatically looking at people who are similar aged peers which means they're asking the same kinds of questions. And like we talked about when we were talking about with circles of support, maybe you're going after them looking for a roommate, and what you end up with is someone who's going to be on your circle of support because they want the same thing from you as you want from them. You know, they're a realtor and they can help with housing needs in the future and you're a financial planner and you're going to help them with that, right? So always you should be thinking about opening your eyes and making some partnerships here. Ask people who graduated with your loved one if they are ready to move. Even if they weren't close, what we would call maybe friends with people with whom they graduated, we don't, like we talked about, you don't necessarily need to be best friends with your roommate. Do they have a good network of people? Are you connected with the parents of that group of folks who are friendly with each other? That, again, that takes a lot of the vetting and the fear and all those kinds of things out of it and the awkward social piece that happens in the beginning, and you can kind of get down to brass tacks right away and start talking as a family about, you know, my kid's never going to clean. Like, <laughs> you know, so we're going to have to do a bad can, can you live with that? Can we hire a cleaner? Does your kid clean? And my kid will do the wedding. You know, that's, it's a much easier and more comfortable conversation to have, even for people with whom you haven't spoken in many years, because you have a history together. And that's true all the time. When you bump into people from high school or you see people on Facebook or whatever you haven't talked to in 20 years, you feel a connection with them 
that is in some ways irrational because you, you have no idea what's going on in their lives, but there's a comfort level there, right? And that's a great way to open the door and start talking about things and navigating through those folks. Chris Davis talking about how she posted on Facebook. She, she put a closed post. It just went to people who were her friends on Facebook with the ads that she looked for for her son's live-in attendance. Like that, you know. It's a, it's a very, very big network. And you have hundreds of friends on Facebook, and those people have hundreds of friends like we talked about. If you make a list of the people that you write down or that you encounter over the course of a month, things go pretty far, pretty fast. Um, and developing a sign or a flyer with some information, and then sharing it. So if you have a house of worship near you, a community center near you, a social and rec club near you, a school near you, high school, college, community college, those kinds of things, great places to start looking and asking. Those are folks who are always sitting down reading flyers, looking for things, happens all the time. What I would add to the finding a roommate is yeah. be open to what kind of roommate. You know, previously yeah. we talked about all those different kinds. So write the ad in a way that it's going to be appealing to any of those things. You know, you're not necessarily limiting it to I am looking for a person with a cognitive disability. <laughs> you know, you're, you're really keeping it open. People, I, I, uh, Lucy, you're absolutely right. People just stand at these boards and just. Mm -hmm. You know, read all, all that Your stuff. local bagel shop, yeah. your local coffee yeah. shop. Yeah. Putting I color can't. on things, a picture on things, a picture of a house, a picture of your local point soccer. We all look at pictures. I could look at photo albums of people I've never met in my whole life for hours. There's something about it that's <laughs> fascinating, right? It draws us to it. Those are kinds of things that you think about the same way you would use up any flyer or yard sale posting, you know. Colors, fonts, pictures, whatever. Uh, and then, if you feel like this networking thing, we've tried it, or it's not my, it's not my cup of tea. <laughs> there are tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of roommate resources, and this area is so populous, you are never going to find a shortage of options. No. And all of these work in different ways, and Jeannie's done a fantastic job of giving you a little bit of a sense of what these websites do. So you can, there are sites that just allow you to search for rentals that are going to come partnered with roommates. There are sites that do roommate matching based upon you doing a survey, kind of like a match.com, but for roommates, so you're inputting information. There are sites that are just databases, so you can go and search for criteria that you like. There are sites that work on housing profiles, plus your personal profile, where do you want to live, what kind of housing, plus who are you as a person. Uh, all kinds of things. You can search other people's detailed profiles rather than just a search ad for them. I mean, there are loads and loads and loads. So this is more than 10. I have like a dozen resources that I guarantee you, if nothing else is an exercise, go online, type in your zip code, and see what comes up. There's a lot of people out there looking for roommates. This is Northern Virginia, and the living is expensive. So if nothing else, know that you have a huge pool that is only going to be growing as our population booms of people who have a potential interest in this. And you don't need to find 300 potential roommates. You need to find a handful that you're going to meet and talk to. I can say when I was having kiddos and start, first starting to look at child care options, I went to websites and just did this exactly, mm -hmm. like went mm -hmm. to these places. And like, I wasn't even ready to start thinking about who actually would be doing this, but I needed the security of knowing that there were places I could go and that real results came up at the mm -hmm. end. And I probably spent half a day just looking through that, and that was enough to give me peace of mind for a while. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're not at the point where you think <laughs> we're ready to real, like, do the real deal, sit down. Go out there and look and know that even yeah. if you don't want to do the networking, even if you never want to post an ad, even if you don't want to do any of that, you can sit at your computer and, my and do a ton of this. Computer. Well, and he, so yeah, he might really like this. <laughs> and then this is one less anxiety dream you're going to have. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're going to well, at least I don't have to worry, but there are a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I may have to worry about other things. All right. So this, of course, begs the question. Ooh, I'm up. And you know, <laughs> ironically, we're really ahead of schedule today. This is really unusual. So if anybody needs to take a break or a stretch, oh, please yeah. do. Mm -hmm. Normally we're frantic that we're running out of time. <laughs> do your due, due diligence. I don't know why they picked me. To do <laughs> I'm going to be telling you what to do. Okay, so, uh, uh, for, you know, use some basic common sense and safety. Basic, basic common sense. 
some of us are from a generation where online meant you were waiting to get into a theater. So you remember, <laughs> online is exposing whatever you put there is out there. So don't provide your last name or personal contact, uh, contact information in the ad. That, that's pretty common. You know, you go to StubHub, it might be, I'm Jamie and I got tickets for a basketball game. That's all you need to know. Uh, consider using a dummy email address. It's very easy to get an email address that's specific for one per purpose. I have multiple email addresses. One is what I use to register for everything because I get a zil yeah, that's where I get my Asian beauty <laughs> junk mail. You know, I never have dealt with an Asian beauty, but I get a lot of email for Asian beauty. No, seriously, I don't want my business email cluttered with all this stuff. You can get a free one. It's no big deal. Just do it for this purpose. And maybe even have a clever, you know, name in the thing. Um, when you set up your interview, make sure it's in a public place. And probably some place that's convenient. Don't pick a place you've never been before. If you know, think of a place there with plenty of people around you, like a coffee shop, like there aren't that many in the room. <laughs> and that's I do have to admit I do my stub hub dealing at a Starbucks because <laughs> it's pretty safe. And you just look for the person coming in with a basketball ticket. <laughs> or a rec center. But again, remember some of these things like a rec center you got to be attentive if there's an admission. You know, you got to think about it. Where will I meet this person? If you have to pay the instant you get in the door, there's no place to sort of meet. So think about that. Bring a family member or friend with you. I'm not sure I would have a, my loved one with a disability just go out there on their own and sort of, you know, venture with that. Uh, ask for references. Once you meet this person, and get as much as you can about that person. And quick note, yeah, please. you should be prepared to provide your references. Yeah. You want a roommate who's going to be doing their due diligence. <laughs> yeah, you're not wonderful just because you put the ad in. You know, they're, they're just as wary of you as you are of them. And uh, take a pad and pencil. You know, you're going to be, this is a business kind of thing. You want to write this stuff down. You don't want to go there unprepared, and they're going to give you names and email addresses and phone numbers. You go, oh, my, oh my God, what am I? What am I going to do? You've got to be prepared. This is a business engagement. On those references, think ahead. What are you going to ask? You know, I'm sure many of you have gotten calls. You know, you've used a contractor. Then they say, can I use you as a reference? You get a call. I like to be, when I call references for like home things, I ask them the same questions. Mm -hmm. You know, so that you have sort of an apples and apples kind of thing. Think ahead. It's not just enough to get the name. Um, Find out more about that individual's habits and background. A little bit, did they just fly into town last night? <laughs> Are they on probation? <laughs> no, I mean, really, you know, ask some questions. Why, you know, why are you interested in doing this? I'll tell you why we're interested in doing this. And, uh, you know, really try to find out. Do some research. The, the, the sex offender register, I don't mean this to alarm you, but people are identified on the sex offender registry. And so if that's a concern you have, access it. It's public information, public information. Now, just to let you know the extremes that provider agencies who have to conform with licensure for the state, they have to do an interstate uh, background check through the FBI with a fingerprint and, in addition, a child abuse registry check. So they're, they're really thorough and they, they go through that. You can do that privately. I wouldn't encourage you to go to that extreme, but you, if you, you can get anything you want it to pay for it. So you can do something like that if you want. But uh, remember, yeah. you're going to have to get the individual's consent to yes. do it. Yes. So, yes. So Don't try and lift their fingerprints off the coffee cup. Yes. That's right. <laughs> That's a little a bit point. of a turnoff in an interview when you say, I'd like you to sign this consent form so that I can go through it. <laughs> so yeah, I wouldn't sometimes encourage more it. informal ways are a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I meant that as the only example, if you're going through a provider, they're going right. to be doing all that mm -hmm. for you. Yes, yeah, thank you, because you don't want to scare these people. It's like, oh, my God, <laughs> what am I doing here? Google the person. Oh, my God, Google has become a verb. It is an mm -hmm. official verb. Do mm -hmm. it. Use it. You know, you'd be surprised. People come up, you know, they got a sports award, they're on a team, they're in a running club. People's names are on there for all sorts of innocuous reasons. They don't have to be a famous person to be on there. Um, look them up in Facebook. <laughs> if you use Facebook. Look them up in LinkedIn if you use LinkedIn. 
maybe Instagram. I don't know, maybe they're a good photographer. But the point is there's, there's ways to find things about this. As a father of two daughters, I might have done that in the past with potential dates. I might, <laughs> might have. I don't remember if I did or didn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, I might have done that with those two boys in New York who <laughs> my daughter found on Craigslist. I might have. So the point is do your due diligence on this. Be very careful. Any, any thoughts on that in terms of safety, security, or any experiences you've had? The other reason to bring a family member or a friend with you is it's it's the same situation as when you go to buy a new house yes. or rent an apartment. <laughs> and you go in and you immediately go, oh, my God, I love this kind of car. Yeah. And you completely <laughs> miss the fact that the toilet is leaking. Falling off the wall. <laughs> this is what happens it's when you see people. Mm-hmm. And I think Tia had a great story a couple sessions back about, about a, a caregiver that you were hiring where, where you were like, I love this caregiver, and your daughter started like reaming her. Right. Like, what? <laughs> that's, right. That's, right. that's a good one. Sometimes you need that other set of eyes and ears to be able to listen and go, oh, this person just totally pulled the wool over your eyes, and you didn't even see it. Right. Well, and another thing is, it's not so far fetched, but your loved one may love Starbucks. And just going to Starbucks, they'll do anything and be so excited <laughs> about being in Starbucks that they're missing the point that this is why we're here, is to see if you want to live with this person. Yeah. And they're just, oh, can I get the Frappuccino today, you mm-hmm. promise? You know, and I'm not making fun, but you all know what I'm saying, that they, they get sidetracked. What do we have? <laughs> I heard an oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. What about, uh, Ruth, pull out your roommate questionnaire. So this was our homework that we had done that you were kind of looking at in two ways. What questions were you hoping the potential roommate would answer in what way? And how would you be answering them if you were answering about your loved one? So we all want to live with someone who's neat and tidy and loves to clean, but if your answer is my loved one is a big old slob, <laughs> maybe we need to think about some trade-offs there. <laughs> I, and I'm, I'm actually doing I sat down by accident. Mm-hmm. Um, so are you tidy, messy, or in between? And in addition to how you are, what's your tolerance to that other person being tidy, messy, or in between? Because they can get along if they're different. Are you quiet but like to be around social people? If you're quiet, do you like to be uninterrupted, quiet, or does that just mean you don't articulate what's on your mind? Uh, You know, you can be introverted but enjoy having that around, or you might feel threatened that somebody's interrogating you. (laughs) You you know, you got to sort of think what that means. Um, Do you mind noise when you sleep? And it can be sleeping noise that you're hearing. <laughs> you, know, what is it, you know, what is the tolerance? Or if, if your roommate gets up at a time different than when you wake up, is that going to throw you all off? You really got to think about these things. We tend to shelter our children and sort of accommodate them, and we're not aware of those, you know, that, that those things are controlled by us. And when they're another experience, it's not necessarily controlled. Uh, what must you have in a roommate okay with pets? Pets is a big thing. I mean, I can't go out to eat in Vienna without have, you know, tripping over dogs. It's just outrageous in Vienna. It's like being in Paris. Uh, and what can't you have? Smoker. This is a pretty major thing. Smoking can be, you know, this can even be with somebody you're dating. This is, you know, yes or no. I'm not judging it. I'm just saying that these are the things you have to decide. Is this a, a deal breaker? Uh, do you want a cohabitant or a best friend who lives there? Okay, do you, does your loved one want to be, hi, how was your day? What did you do today? What did you have for lunch? You know, <laughs> and, and that's okay if they want that, but that's, you know, you know, that kind of roommate may not be compatible with everybody else. You've got to really think about what does your loved one do when they come home during the day? Do they decompress? Do they sort of just sit back? Do they go to their room and wait for dinner to be made? What is it? Similarly, do you, let, let, let's inter, interject there the sort of inflexibility some of our people have. And, uh, uh, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So does your loved one essentially have to watch Jeopardy as soon as, he, as, as dinner's over and cannot talk to anybody, you know, or whatever it might be? Or is Thursday I wear yellow and eat spaghetti? You know, whatever it might be, you got to think about these things because you know it, your loved one knows it, 
roommate's not going to know that intuitively. you got to think about, can somebody deal with that? Can my loved one deal with them? If they eat a different food on that day, even if my child isn't eating, is that going to freak them out? You know? there, there's some people who have to have a TV on to sleep. I'm sorry? Some people have to have noise. Oh, yeah, that's a good Idiot. point. The white noise or the TV in the background, yeah. right. That, those things need to be discussed. Don't just take that for granted that everybody sleeps with Jimmy Fallon on when you're going to sleep. <laughs> Not everybody does. You know, you know. Now, my wife falls asleep with the baseball games because they never end on time. So that's a whole other thing. Can you share a room? Okay, let's talk about sharing the room, the twin beds, the room, oh, the noise, the light, the everything else. Can you even share, you know, well, the bathroom is a whole other thing, but can you even share if there's only one room plus the two bedrooms, or do you need another little sitting area? you got to really think about it. What is, you know, what is your loved one tower? The bathroom can be major, major, major in terms of scheduling. Some of our loved ones are not so quick. <laughs> they are very fastidious. They take a long time. They're used to having a lot of, you know, space to move around and whatever, we really got to think that if you're, that might be a question you want to talk about. What is your schedule? What, you know, do you like to bathe at night? Do you like to be shower in the morning? Whatever it might be, you got to get all that out there in terms of questions. Well, and this one was a real, this one yeah. was a really interesting issue for Sissy, who, who when she called in, she, she talked about they had to find a two bedroom and a two bathroom, which yeah. is not oh, yeah. an easy thing to find in this area, no. but she knew that a live-in aid would never last. <laughs> if that living aid had to share a bathroom with her son. Oh, yeah. So she, one of the accommodations, so she asked for the accommodation and the voucher program for the living aid, but she also asked for an accommodation for an increased payment standard from the <laughs> voucher program yeah. so that she could get a two-bedroom, two-bathroom for, for her son. Yeah. Because she knew that if they had to share a bathroom, it, the living aid would be gone within three days. Oh, I think that's so, a pretty critical thing. Once yeah. our daughters moved out, my wife and I each have our own bathroom. Yeah. I don't know how I survived all that. <laughs> <laughs> so it, was, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was a really interesting conversation that we went through yeah. to kind of come to that realization that that's just not going to work if they have to share a bathroom. And you should. Due to his unique characteristics yeah. and needs. It's not judgmental. It's not positive or negative. You know your person. Just get it out there. Don't feel guilty about it or, or whatever. Similarly, think about things like um, lighting versus darkness. You know, people have different expectations and tolerance in their apartments. Think about the, the temperature. Think about open windows versus never open a window. I want to hear the birds. I can't stand if I hear the birds. You know, all these things that we might take for granted, you really got to have some thinking about that. And you might <coughs> have to have conversations with your loved one because, as I said, you've done this all. You've protected. You've created this comfort zone for them. You may not realize what's really critical for them that you take for granted. You know, you, you've dealt with it all these years. You look like you got some knowledge in this thing. What are you thinking? Well, no, I really do. Well, for a period of time, we moved down to Florida. My yeah. son and I, we were going to, I built a house down there. So we rented a condo until the house was built. And we only had one bathroom. Oh. And so, you know, my son loves to watch HGTV. Yeah. And he told me sitting there and saying, oh, they cannot live with one bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and they got to get another bathroom. And, and so we know. Now, yeah, we, yeah. We had that experience. Well, the other thing to think about when, when we, I think we talked about this when we talked about the actual, the housing, the physical part is, is the bathroom through the bedroom? You know, I mean, again, you got to really think these things through. You want somebody trouncing through the bedroom to go to the bathroom. That's sort of a crazy disruption. So any other thoughts on, on these kinds of things? You got some ideas of what, if you have not done your questionnaire, do it or just take some notes from what we're saying today. But this is the kind of uh, information you need to take with you when you have this conversation with a potential roommate so that you're not forgetting things, you know, when you're going on. All right. Uh, so the real fun. The real fun. Assuming that you found a roommate, you've gone through sort of that interview and information exchange process, and you've come up with an, uh, you, you both agreed that yes, we're going to live together. Um, oh, and actually, one other thing between, between uh, finding that roommate and before you live together, if you 
get onto one of those sites where you're actually going to interview a roommate who has the housing and you're going to live with them, it's really important to note that if you're going to move into somebody's place who already has the housing, mm -hmm. as opposed to you've got the housing and they're moving into your place, mm -hmm. you really want to confirm with them that they are allowed to sublet mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. according oh. under the terms of their lease. Because if they're not, you could be bounced out of there very quickly um, based on the fact that the landlord's going to evict you. Mm -hmm. um, because you, you will not have a, a, uh, a legal and binding agreement, especially if they don't have you sign any kind of lease or any kind of uh, occupancy agreement. So I just wanted to mention that really quickly because in some cases this may not be an issue of the person moving in with your son or daughter, but it may be an issue of you moving in with the other person if they're providing the housing. The other thing, similar, on a similar vein, let's say it's a homeowner who is offering you a space offering the individual a space, you're also going to want to look up that homeowner's uh, uh, address in the, the uh, county or city's tax, real estate tax mm -hmm. assessment database and make sure that there's no lien mm -hmm. or foreclosure on that house because mm -hmm. you don't want to be moving into a house <laughs> where the bank's going to take it away in another month. Right. <laughs> so. I know these things sound a little horrific, but after having just gone through the recession, I think we can all appreciate that there's yeah. a lot of that stuff that has occurred in the past, and we have all learned from those mistakes. Mm -hmm. So just sort of a word to the wise. Right. Um, uh, that, that stuff still can happen. There are a couple more protections that have been put into place since 2007, but you'd rather not have to rely on those protections. Just know up front. That that's probably not the place. Yeah. To the place. eviction is going to be who lives there. <laughs> yeah. They don't ask to see who owns this. Just get I'm out paying of there. my rent. Yeah, that's get right. out of there. <laughs> you just didn't take that and <laughs> get a mortgage. <laughs> so, so just a couple of a couple of tips before we move on to roommates and leases. But uh, Jeannie, have you experienced anything with like homeowner association rules and regulations? Or? Oh, yeah. not typically. Homeowners associations don't typically. Uh, have those kind of rules. Okay. Now, condo associations may have limitations on what unit owners can do with mm -hmm. their property in terms of uh, who they can rent to mm -hmm. and, and things like that and what the terms of, of, of leasing can be. Um, but uh, HOA is not typically. Okay, okay. Um, my daughter's attendant, one of my daughters attendant, and the, her roommates have to move out of the house that they're renting because there were too many people in the home that were not uh, that were unrelated. Yeah. Unrelated. That's a zoning issue. Yeah, that's zoning. What is that, six? Is that that's a, yeah, you can't have more than four unrelated four, people, uh, in Fairfax County at least, mm -hmm. uh, live in a, in, a, in a dwelling unit together, um, except in a couple of very unique circumstances where they have the, uh, a rule that's called the Kate and Alley rule, where if you have two uh, uh, families that have uh, a certain under a certain number of small children coming with each of the, the, the single fam single parent families mm. living together, then you're allowed to have mm. more than that four unrelated people. Would the size of the house matter? Nope. So four is the yeah. drop dead limit, Jeannie, is what yeah. you're saying. Yeah, four. It's for for the purposes that we're talking about. It's generally four unrelated. You can't have more than four unrelated mm. people together. That rule does not apply to group homes. So do right. not even right, right, let that right. thought enter your mind. Right, right. That's right. <laughs> right. Group homes are exempted from that. That's a whole different. But we're not thing. talking about group homes. Right. <laughs> so just in case you were going, but well, wait a minute, we've had <laughs> so yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about roommates and leases, and sort of the different ways that roommates can be treated on leases. Um, this is really important because you want to, of course, you know, maximize the. Uh, uh, you want to, uh, I think Joan brought up before that you know you, you want to sort of make sure that the individual has as many rights as possible on the lease and is protected as much as possible from any any bad things that could potentially happen if there's a breakup generally because mm -hmm. roommates sometimes get air quotes divorced <laughs> um, and you need to make sure that that split uh, is does does the minimal amount of harm to the individual both financially as obviously as well as socially and emotionally. Um, so, 
there are a couple of different ways that roommates can be treated on leases, and those will have implications for finances and things like that. The, one of the best ways to do this is if roommates can have separate leases in the same unit. There are not a ton of landlords that will allow you to do that. This is really at the landlord's discretion. Um, so if you, uh, when, it, when two people go into a unit, it's the first thing that I would, ever, I would ask is, would you be willing to put uh, these individuals on separate leases in the same unit? That way, both people have landlord-tenant rights, both people are paying their own checks, but they're treated as um, uh, individuals and they are not what they call jointly and severally liable for each other for rent or for damages. So if one person doesn't pay their rent, the other person is not held responsible for the first person's rent. Or if one person causes, if person A causes damage to the unit, tenant causes damage, then person B is held responsible for tenant A's damages. So that's why having separate leases in the same unit can be really beneficial if you can find a landlord who's willing to do that. Is that pretty rare? It, it is pretty rare just because most landlords don't want to do the extra paperwork. <laughs> it's really that simple. Um, however, uh, I would strongly recommend that, for example, if <clears throat> you ever were in a situation where you were administering, where, where you were renting the house, um, this is the way that I would do it if you were the landlord. So there are situations where parents have become landlords for um, their son or daughter under the voucher program and another roommate and things like that. I would always do it this way. And that way you're not at risk of having to, you know, kick one person out or, I'm sorry, kick both people out, that kind of thing. Um, Another way that you can treat roommates on a lease is that both roommates are on the lease and are jointly severally liable for rent, damages, lease compliance, et cetera. This is typically the way a landlord's gonna handle it. But in that case, then you're going to have those, the issues that I just mentioned, where if person A causes damage or doesn't pay the rent, then person B could potentially be responsible for all of that. So that's a real, that's a real risk for person B or vice versa depending on how it works. So that's um, where you were talking a little bit about having that emergency fund mm -hmm. <laughs> stockpiled just in case because those things can happen. So, um, so, but that's more likely the way that most landlords are gonna want to treat uh, the situation just because it's, it's what's the most expedient and convenient for them. So um, another way that you could do this is roommate A is the leaseholder and roommate B is a non-paying occupant. So where this would come into play is if a person had, for example, a live-in aid. So roommate A is the person with a disability. Roommate B may be the live-in aid. Roommate B is not paying anything to live there. But roommate B should also, uh, so roommate A is solely liable for the rent, damages, lease compliance, um, and this also would mean that roommate A is it, uh, liable for the occupant's damages and lease compliance. Um, so he's responsible for all of that. Um, roommate B is not liable, but roommate B also doesn't have tenancy rights. So what happens in this case is if roommate A fires roommate B, roommate B's got to go. They can trash the place though before they leave. They, yeah. they, might, trash, they right. might trash the place before they leave. Yeah. However, roommate A could also um, uh, go to the police and say, I want a no trespassing order. Mm -hmm. Get a no trespassing order ex executed, and roommate B's got to go or he's going to be arrested. <laughs> so not that you ever want to get that far, but that's what you can do. I mean, that's, that is mm -hmm. totally within roommate A's power to do in that situation. So, and trust me, this happens a lot. <laughs> this is not something that is out of the ordinary. Um, so this is, this is and, and this is the way you want to go as opposed to uh, having roommate B have occupancy rights and now roommate A has to go through the eviction process mm -hmm. in the court, mm -hmm. which could take months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's the benefit of this kind of arrangement when you're working with a live-in a, a live aid or, or, or uh, a person who is providing any kind of support that you need to get out. It sounds like it's a quick out, Jeannie, right? It's the quicker, yeah. the quicker out. Yeah. 
I just wanted to add mm -hmm. to this, in terms of qualifying for the lease, mm -hmm. uh, most landlords will take up to two to qualify for the lease uh, payment. Up to two? Two tenants. Two tenants. So if you have more than two, the third and fourth may have to come in as a sublease. Mm. So usually... Uh, or as an occupant, as, or as, an occupant, as an occupant yeah, on the lease, uh, as right, opposed to... Right, as to be uh, on the lease itself. Right, yeah. right. So in terms of qualifying for the lease, most landlords will take up to two. Okay. To qualify. So if Finan you you're saying financially qualified. Financially, financially, right. Yeah. Right. Well, and that's another consideration, because the other issue will be if you actually need the other person on your lease in order right. to be able to financially qualify. Right. That gets us into the other conversation that we're going to talk about in two weeks yes. around negotiating with landlords. <laughs> so we're not going to talk about that quite yet. <laughs> so what happens if you have a lease and the lease is expired and you want the person to come back and sign the lease again and they refuse to sign? So then, they, then, they, then they have to move. They're they're out. They have to move if it's the last scenario you described. They That's have good. to move if it's any scenario I'm describing. <laughs> Because otherwise they're an illegal occupant in that unit. And so in other well, words, if yeah. they are, if they, if you have separate leases in the same unit, they have to come back and sign their lease, or they're an illegal occupant. And then what? And they won't move out. And then what do you do? And then, well, and then the landlord in, in in the separate leases in the same unit, if they don't move out, then then they are. Uh, they're a, a, I can't remember what the proper term is. Not a squatter. It's not, it's yeah. Essentially, that's yeah. what they are. Yeah. And they're going to, um, the landlord's going to have to go through the eviction process. Yeah, that. right. In the second, in, in, if they're both on the same lease and jointly severally liable, then if they, if they don't sign the lease, then they're going to be an illegal occupant and they're going to put the indi your individual mm -hmm. in jeopardy mm -hmm. because now your individual has violated the lease by having an illegal occupant mm -hmm. in the unit. If they don't leave and they're the non-paying occupant, now, um, now they're, they're also an illegal occupant in the unit, yeah. and they could put your person in jeopardy. But if you go and get a no, a no trespassing order, um, because they were, they were uh, supposed to be considered a non-paying occupant before, um, and you can say, look, this person was a non-paying occupant before, I fired them, or they were supposed to leave and they didn't leave, if you can make, the, if you can make enough of a justification to the police, you may be able to get a no trespassing order and have them banned from the unit. Um, and then the fourth option is roommate A, the person with a disability is uh, a, a leaseholder, and subleases, if your lease allows this, permits this, you can only do this if the lease permits this, mm -hmm. and many leases forbid subleasing. Mm -hmm. um, but if it permits it, roommate A can sublease to roommate B. Roommate B might be just a roommate. They might be a, the uh, companion or the caregiver or a living aid or something like that. So it just, it just depends on the scenario. Um, in this case, roommate A is going to be solely liable to the landlord, again, for rent, damages, lease compliance, including being liable for the sublessee's damages and compliance with the lease. And roommate B is liable to roommate A for rent, damages, sublease compliance, etc. In this case, though, roommate, a, um, sorry, roommate B does have tenancy rights. You just gave them tenancy rights by having them sign a sublease agreement. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you would have to go through the eviction process. Um, you're not going to just be able to do that no trespassing uh, order. So I don't necessarily mm -hmm. endorse this solution, and it's unlikely that you're ever going to be able to do it because most well, lease agreements don't don't particularly allow subleasing, at least in, in Northern Virginia, that I'm, I've seen. But those are, the, those are sort of the different ways that roommates could be treated on a lease um, and sort of the implications depending on, depending on what happens and how you get divorced. So the, all of that to say... Um, Jeannie, before you move on to the next one, just staying with the lease part versus <laughs> the roommate part, are the leases in Northern Virginia typically standard boilerplate language, or are they specific uh, to the units? They they vary greatly depending on the landlord. Okay, the reason I was going to uh, ask that is because I know my daughter's lease in New York is very detailed and very specific. 
So one of the things she ran into was what does she have the authority to call somebody to repair an appliance or does she have to go through the owner? That kind of detail is specified in the lease. And she's now out a couple hundred dollars because she couldn't deal with it anymore, so she called the place to have them come do it. And the landlord said, you didn't have the authority to do that. I'm not going to pay you. So it's that, it's, if it's, if, don't assume it's boilerplate. Yeah. Bo boiler, couldn't get that out. Boilerplate, yep. Boilerplate, <laughs> couldn't get that out. And read it. Similarly, pets, you know, they're mm -hmm. going to be very specific about that. And it may be a pet visiting versus a pet living. You just be very cautious with the leases. So I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. So, the, so leases are, obviously, all, all leases for, Multi-family apartment properties, or any any situation where there where an, a property owner owns two or more units in Virginia, have to follow Virginia Residential Tenant oh. Landlord Act. Okay. Virginia Residential Tenant Landlord Act has certain key requirements that leases have to. And we do go over this in a lot of greater detail in our July session yeah, about I just wanted to, just here. But even though we're roommates today, just keep right. this in but mind. Even, but even even so. That, those are only some very basic core principles, and, and leases in this area can vary greatly mm -hmm. in terms of what their terms and conditions are. Mm -hmm. So you do need to read them very carefully, especially when it comes to things like subleasing um, and number of occupants and things like, things like that. So that's really, really yeah, I didn't mean to to get us off track for that's roommates, right. but... <laughs> My only note here is, of course, like everything else, this is a two-way street. This roommate... This is their home, too, right? They yeah. are also going to be expecting some protection. So as much as you can think about this on only the con side and worry about this roommate going off the rails and punching holes in all the walls and leaving you liable for stuff, mm -hmm. they are going to worry the same thing about you. That's, that's just life with a roommate. And for mm -hmm. most people, you are far better off saying, well, I'll do good vetting, I'll do good screening, I'll yep. do good interviews, I'll use a social network which is in its own kind of filtering in the first place to find this person because it's a friend of a friend or somehow I have a better referral in the first yep. place. Absolutely. And setting aside a small portion of my money every month to save in the event that something does go really bananas, then I am paying the full cost for everything all the time to try and avoid any possible negative roommate scenario. Mm -hmm. So it's just, yeah, no, that's <laughs> ab absolutely true because, I mean, this is, this is just life. This is mm -hmm. the way the way it rolls, and I can tell you, I having been probably one of the few people that's had probably more roommates than I can count. <laughs> <laughs> um, that you, you learn from each time, mm -hmm. and and you really do start to realize, okay, this is how I'm going <laughs> to narrow the field so that I can I can sort of put these protections into place. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the uh, non-paying roommate. Is it always the case that they don't have any uh, right to occupy or no legal protection? No, it depends on how you structure it. Because if they signed a sublease with Which you, even if they weren't paying, yeah. 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 yeah, right. But if it, right. But if it's, yes, the, the fact that it's very unlikely that you could even do that, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, means that person. Typically, in those situations, they're not going to have much protection. Following on the point that Lisa so so long as yeah. you have. Um, right. So long as you have clearly, that gets us into sort of the stuff that we talked about on the webinar previously, mm -hmm. where you then have to put together an employment agreement with that person mm -hmm. that then clearly explains to that individual that their employment is conditioned, or I'm sorry, their housing mm -hmm. is conditioned upon their employment. Yeah. And should their employment terminate? So will their housing, right. and so that's the one of the things that you would basically be bringing to the, you know, if it got to the point that you had to do a no trespassing order, you would basically be bringing that agreement plus the letter of termination of their employment to the police, saying, "I terminated this person as of this date. They were told they were no longer allowed to be here." Right. They're an employee who is go. residing there. Right. So, and that's basically your justification. And that is typical, considering uh, many apartment complexes uh, hire their staff. I mean, I mean, the apartment owners allow their staff to live on the premises. And many yeah. apartment owners mm -hmm. do this very same thing that I'm okay. talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Right. The, the other thing that that an apartment property may ask you for in in the roommate A 
is the leaseholder roommate B is a non-paying occupant scenario, especially if roommate B is a live-in aide, is some, some apartment properties, if they are savvy and know what they're doing, will ask the roommate A and will ask the live-in aide to sign what's called a live-in aide addendum to the lease. that basically says, I understand that this person is a live-in aide and has no occupancy rights in this unit, and if this person no, no longer becomes a live-in aide, or is no longer serving as a live-in aide, they must terminate their occupancy immediately or they will be basically, you know, we will pursue a no trespassing type of thing. Mm -hmm. and, they'll, and it explains all of the, it basically goes on to talk about all the scenarios in which this person needs to leave the unit. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very, very And clear. we did send out an addendum like that previously when we talked about live-in aides in our session, so you do have a copy, and if you just search in your email for live-in aid addendum, it'll come, yeah. that's how the file is. Really, and, and frankly, you know, the landlord's doing it for the landlord's protection, sure. but it's, it actually helps protect the roommate A, sort of by default, too. It, uh, so basically, between the live-in aid addendum, the employment agreement, the, and the termination letter uh, of the employment for the live-in aid, those are sort of the, 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 the key pieces of paper you would have to be able to have to demonstrate that you clearly have no right to live here anymore, you need to get off my property. <laughs> what was the third item, Jeannie? The, the, the live-in aid addendum yeah. from, uh, to the lease, right. the employment agreement yeah. with the live-in aid that yeah. has that condition in it that says your housing is contingent upon your employment, yeah. mm -hmm. and then the termination letter of the live-in aid. Uh, so if you were to get mm -hmm. rid of the live-in aid, you're basically saying you're terminated, you're hereby required to leave this housing unit by X date. <laughs> so you're, if you notice, none of those are verbal. Yes. None of those are verbal. This is all in writing. Mm -hmm. We got to be serious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that's that's what you would take if you if you got to that point. All right. But Jeannie's going to ward us away from I'm all this. I'm going to ward you off. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> We're not going to have any trouble with these roommates. So. Um, so, well, actually, we just talked about this. This is great. I love it when I set myself up <laughs> for, good, for, good, for good things, yes. <laughs> so to ward off trouble with roommates, you want to have that clear agreement with things that matter most to you. Now, we were talking about it in the context of a living aid, when you're a living aid, but you want to have an agreement when your roommate is just a plain old roommate. <laughs> So we've given you actually sort of uh, two samples of, of roommate agreements. Now, these kinds of roommate agreements don't really have um, necessarily the capacity to be enforced in court. They're truly just agreements. They're setting out sort of in principle how we agree to behave with each other. But they're at least giving some general guidance and rules and some ideas about how it is we're going to resolve disputes together so that there's, there's some there's something to be able to fall back on. And this is really important, as mm -hmm. Dennis was saying earlier, for people who have some cognitive limitations, people who have some communication limitations, people who have some problem-solving right. limitations. Judgment. Right, because what we often find when we work with individuals who are in roommate situations, not even roommate situations that family have created, but just roommate situations mm -hmm. that maybe the community services board or right. a provider has created. It could be a, just a provider that's created its own uh, housing and brought together people is we'll go back and say let's take a look at your roommate agreement and let's see what it says there about this situ about situations like this and we'll all sit down and we'll look at what it says and we'll say so have you guys done this yet and gee it says here that the chores are going to be done on this frequent, you know, this, this basis, and that this person's going to be responsible for this, and that person's going to be responsible for that. How is that working right now? Is that working right now? Well, let's talk about how we're going to fix that. So it's really just a tool to help keep, keep people on track, and when people get off track, get them back on track. <laughs> That's really the, what the, the agreement is. Um, you're going to help, help folks uh, decide to divide the work um, or the effort, or household costs, or figure out what they're going to trade off back and forth. Um, and all of that's going to be put into that agreement. Um, it, the household costs are a really big thing, and that's definitely something that you want to make sure that roommates kind of address up front. Those household costs can include things like 
the purchase of supplies, um, the purchase of uh, food, if there's any shared food that's going to be purchased, utility costs, all those kinds of things. So who's going to be responsible for the phone bill? Who's going to be responsible for the electric bill? Um, and is there going to be a sort of a, a reconciliation at the end of the year? How, how, are, you going to, how are you going to work that out? Mm -hmm. um, so remember, nobody is perfect on these agreements. Um, so there has to be a little bit of forgiveness or a little bit of, okay, we're going to try this one again. <laughs> uh, but at least you've got, again, the structure to be able to work from. Again, decide on a mediator and a mediation system up front and include that in the agreement. That may be that you're going to go to family. That may be that you're going to go to the support coordinator. That may be, so you have to determine who's going to serve. Somebody in the circle of support has agreed to serve, to serve as your impartial mediator for roommate situations. Got to identify somebody who's going to be sort of the, the mediator or arbitrator for these things. Um, and last but not least, let the roommates take the lead. It shouldn't be the parents solving all the problems here. The roommates are going to have to be the ones who, who identify what the problem is, and they're going to have to be the ones that come up with the solutions, because the solutions that stick the best are the ones that the individuals come up with. You might have to help prompt or guide some solutions, but they're ultimately going to have to agree to them, and they're going to have to say what they're going to do, how often they're going to do it, when it's going to happen, and all of that. And usually the best solutions are the ones that come out in writing and are put on the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's just a little bit of... Uh, so they can't get the stainless steel refrigerator. Yeah, no, they can't get the non-magnetic ones. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's, that's some uh, warding off trouble with roommates' ideas from fo folks who have been there and been burned twice. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of sticking on the refrigerator... <laughs> You got a copy of an example chore chart in your handouts for today. This is a very clear way. You're probably not going to stick a 2- to 10-page roommate agreement in small print up on the refrigerator, but a quick visual reminder of on Monday you're doing this, I'm doing this, who's paying what. Uh, good idea. My mom got remarried late in life, and she and her husband on their mm -hmm. fridge have a chart up that says, you pay these bills, I pay these bills, and not because it's ever contentious, just because it's an easy reminder. Every month, you look back in, and it's their own checklist for themselves. Yeah, I went through and I did all these things. Uh, and it just is another way that's a place everybody sees every day, and it's totally non-confrontational, right? It's not like staring at you and yelling at you. It's just your visual reminder and prompt. So if your loved one is the sort of person who does well, Seeing things is more comforted by having a really clear routine. This is a way to structure it. And, of course, there are other ways to do it other than by days of the week. You can list things out by task. You can write up what your trade-off is going to be by topic. So, for example, like, I'm really sloppy. So I've agreed two to three times a month I'm going to pay for a deep, you know, like a, a maid service mm -hmm. to come in and do the deep cleaning if you agree to do the day-to-day -day dishes, right? So maybe what I'm bringing to the table is money or a resource for the cleaning, and what you're bringing to the table is the day-to-day -day help, and figuring out how you're going to trade off those kinds of things. So really take some time and write down all the things you do in your house over the course of the day that gets done, and it's all those little things like wringing out the sponge after the dishes are done, closing the dishwasher door once you load things up, like all those little things that you want to make sure. Maybe you're not going to spell them out in detail on your daily chore chart, but that in your roommate agreement you say every day, you know, all dishes will be washed and dried and put away rather than do the dishes. Because to you, does that mean leave them in the sink like I did them, like they're clean? <laughs> and they can sit here and rest in this drying rack until all eternity? Uh, so accessible right there. <laughs> I am saving you time. That explains my husband. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. Lucy, if I can interject also to be – have a real detailed conversation about, like, grocery fulfillment, let's call it, you know, leaving that little bit of juice in the refrigerator, <laughs> finishing the, you know, cereal except for one little speck of granola. No, but seriously, because our, you may not want your loved one to be shopping every single day, so you've got to really think that thing through. How, what, is, what is their responsibility? Do they write it on a note when they're done? Do they leave the empty container? What's their skill level in terms of doing that? But again, don't leave things unaccounted for. Think it through. I'm sorry. That's a really good point. <laughs> All right. So if we break up. Oh. Mm -hmm. Breaking up yeah. is hard. Let's get some new <laughs> going on here. 
picture. <laughs> Uh, it may happen at some point, and it may happen on all the best of terms. People have lived together mm -hmm. for five, ten years, and one of them got a job across the county and wants right. to move, or is retiring with their parents. Or I mean, this is certainly not necessarily a negative situation. Or it could be you all have decided you don't want to live together, but you're not angry with each other. You've just decided this is not a good fit for us. <laughs> Let's look yeah. at other options. Uh, that is far more likely than people who, uh, you know, go way off the hinges. Uh, so Jeannie already talked about making sure you know how this is going to affect your lease and the roommate's lease because even though you are not technically responsible for knowing all the terms of their lease, you may need to know how to get those pieces enforced, like Jeannie said. You know, like you are not responsible for going to the police and getting a no trespassing order, but you may want to know that's something that you are able to do, <laughs> allowed under the terms of the way that their lease is structured. So how are you going to afford to live on your own? If you are looking at a voucher, you can't have a situation where suddenly you've got a two-bedroom voucher and you've got one person living there. The voucher is going to say, that's no deal. We're not paying for an extra bedroom for you just for fun. Uh, so you need to have a plan. What is your backup roommate? Who is your emergency fund holder who's going to step in in these kinds of situations? You know, How long is it going to take you to find somebody else who's going to maintain the unit during this time mm -hmm. period? So, for example, if your roommate was the person who did all the day-to-day -day cleaning and you hired the maid service, who is going to step in to keep you from living in squalor in the, <laughs> in the three weeks it is going to take so we don't have dishes and ants piled high in the sky? <laughs> uh, does this affect your voucher? Did you move in with someone who had a voucher and you didn't? And you all were working together that way? Or did you both have vouchers? Are you going to be able to separate them back out after the fact, and these are not questions you particularly have to have the answer to now, but as you go into this agreement and you, you're looking at the tools you're bringing to the table, walk through each one of these tools. Here's the money I'm bringing. Here's the services I'm bringing. Here's the support here's staff the I'm bringing. Here's the voucher I'm bringing. Uh, here are the, the skills and abilities and efforts that I'm bringing. How does this get divided back out the other way? Uh, and any shared resources. So be thinking about if you have folks making joint purchases to move in together, that's something you really want to clearly spell out. If you're buying a coffee maker mm -hmm. together and it's a $200 coffee pot, someone's going to want to take that right. with them when they go. Yeah. Or if the if the electric is in your roommate's name, <laughs> make sure the electric you is sure your name it. before yeah. they leave because you might ha have electricity on the yeah. day that they're gone. <laughs> Uh, and of course, who will be your next roommate? It's not realistically feasible to have a list of 10 people who are at any moment ready to drop their living situation and jump in and move with you. But you do always want to keep in tune, like have your pulse to how the roommate situation is going, have open lines of communication, use your roommate agreement. But if you start to get to the point where you're thinking, I could see a breakup happening, I could also see this getting resolved, let me go back to where I first found a roommate and start putting some loose feelers out there, update my profile on the website where I found this roommate, draft another ad, just being prepared. And I'm not saying you have to keep it up to date every second of every day. You're probably going to have some significant warning signs if things aren't going well. But it is something you want to make sure that you are thinking through and that you know that those avenues continue to be open for having some option. And then, of course, your temporary side support. If they're your live-in staff, you know, who's going to come in for those weeks when they can't? Is it mom coming in? Is it circle of support coming in? Is it private staff? Is it Are you changing your waiver services for a short period of time to make this work? How are you going to pull all these pieces together? And whether it's staff or whether it's a roommate, in either agreement, ask for at least 30 to 60 days notice. Mm -hmm. So that will at least give you the time that you're going to need to be able to start putting preparations together. And, and I would step back even from that 30 and 60 days and maybe decide, well, gee, 90 days before our lease is expiring, let's think about this. And, yeah. You know, let's sort of think it through because maybe the other person hasn't said something, but they're sort of thinking they got somebody else, whatever. Have the conversation. Yeah. Don't wait till the last second. That's um, a really good idea. So... Before next time, we did not overload you with homework, given all of the things that we recapped in the beginning of today. So if there were things right. that we talked about in the beginning about, did you choose your short list of housing options? Did you run through your budget? Did you make a list of locations that are suitable for you? Did you come up with plans for things? And if you thought, I am going to get to that, this is your time. <laughs> get to it. We have a significant break before our next session, the right. way the 4th of July holiday fell and vacations and timing so we won't be back here until July 13th. So that's right. three weeks from today. 
So you have three whole weeks to do catch up. And certainly all of us in varying degrees are available during this time right. period to get back with you if you hit roadblocks and have questions and are trying to follow through with all these other things and get them updated. Be in touch. You always have access to all the webinar recordings if you want to go back and take this time to re-listen to some of these things I referred back to today. And you're like, that doesn't even make a bill. What was the date for session number four? I, I, I think I collapsed. That June 8th. <laughs> the, the, the last one was the 8th. Yeah. They've been every two weeks. It's just this next gap is a three week. Uh, so we have yeah. three yeah. more. Yeah. We have this. Right, three more to do. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sure, so they haven't changed since we first advertised it. So the next session will be July 13th, 13. and that's the session where we're going to be talking about you're really getting ready to move. You are looking over a lease. You're doing that troubleshooting. You're doing your final housing navigation pieces. Uh, after that, we're meeting again just one week later to make up for the kind of three-week mm -hmm. gap we had there. So on July 20th, is our parent housing panel where it's the ask the questions of the other parents who've been there, done that. And then our last session is two weeks after that, August 3rd, and that's our final wrap-up, questions hanging out there, problem solving, troubleshooting, <coughs> et cetera, kind of session. Will, yeah. the, point, will the parent one be on webinar? It will be on webinar, and it will be uh, there will not be a visual to go along with right, it, if you will. I'll probably have one slide up the whole time that says, like, yeah. session seven parent panel. <laughs> I have questions. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be in Georgia. Oh, sure, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, like, always, but, like, I'll be manning the, yeah, I'll be manning the chat you line if you can ask questions. You if there's a Georgian accent. Yeah, oh, I'm sure I will. <laughs> <laughs> and you can always understand. send questions ahead of time, I should note, for that panel, and I can keep a stockpile of questions, even if you just think you're going to feel shy about asking them or you're going to get caught up and you'll forget to ask them. You can always send me those kinds of things in advance. That's a great question. And actually, that would actually help yeah, us in terms right. of structuring what the panel who okay. can cover what on the panel? Yeah, yeah, that would be good. And I'll give them and heads up, too. Lucy, any, uh, any advice or updates on how they can keep their flash drive populated? Yeah, so I try and send emails that cover everything for one session and one email. And it normally has a lot of attachments, but the title of the session and the number of the session are in the subject line of the emails that I send. And then in the jump drive that I gave you, each folder has the title of the session and the number of the session. So it should marry up very, very closely, if not identically, with the email subject line. So you should can just kind of be able to download all of the files from a given right. email and dump them so <laughs> into that folder. So you don't download those attachments first? You, yeah, you would, you would download them yeah. to, to put them onto the jump right. drive, yeah. But, they're, but the point is they're organized. Yeah, and if you have trouble with that sort of thing, of course, like let me know, and I'm happy yeah. to do that uh, to the – the best degree that I can. Lucy's our um, official By no means do you have to say to things that. on the jump drive <laughs> at all. We just kind of crafted it as a place that we could set up the folders for you all ahead of time so you had the names of the sessions and the number of the sessions as a way as you were getting information through this or through things in the future. You already have a place labeled to dump all those things. So if you ever come across something else in terms of a budget, you already have a folder right. set up where you can chuck it right in there and you're not drilling through 100 housing related documents. Yeah, put, you use to this as the basis. If you find other resources, it's yours. It's yours to use. So number four. Yes. It's recorded somewhere. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, was so through the ARC website? It was, the, it was sent out through the, you should have gotten an invitation. Did everybody get that kind of, it looks like an invitation from YouTube that says you've been invited to whatever, whatever, share this link. Your email. Uh, so for okay. every session, and this is just something generally important for folks to know, there are two ways that people signed up for this housing work group. You either signed up on our website saying, I'm coming to all of the in-person sessions. Or you had to sign up for each webinar individually. ReadyTalk, our webinar provider, won't let me say the equivalent. Like, I want to sign up for eight webinars all in a row. So you had to sign up for each one. So for each session we do, I pull the list of whoever has signed up for that individual day's webinar and the list of every single person who signed up to come in person to all of them, and that's who I email for that session. And so sometimes I had a situation a few weeks ago where someone forgot to sign up for one of the webinars. Uh, so when I pulled the list from that webinar and from our online list to say, I'm sending the reminder, I'm sending all the attachments in advance, I'm sending the recording after the fact, because she hadn't signed up for that webinar, she didn't get any of that. The dates were still on our website from where it all was in the first place, and the times are the same, and it's every two weeks and all of that, but because she didn't get the reminder, she didn't come. 
And so I ended up sending things to her after the fact. So that's not the end of the world by any means. Uh, certainly just shoot me an email and I'll have the person on our staff who manages the YouTube bit send you an invitation to view that recording. But again, make sure that if you didn't sign up to attend everything in person, that you were signing up for every webinar because I have to go and pull a separate list for each session that we do. Because if I look at the webinar list online, most sessions have between 15 and 20 people registered and I don't have any sense of how duplicative that is. What, who are these extra five people who are in some of these sessions? So I pull the list for each separate session that you signed up for on the webinar, plus every single person who signed up to attend in person, and I paste those together for each time we do this. I'll stop our recording now.